Uh, welcome. Good morning to this uh, very special occasion to uh, honor the uh, works and contributions and life of Tom Schelling, uh, a truly unique figure in the Academy and in a number of areas that he has so insightfully analyzed. I'm Michael Nacht. I'm Dean of the Goldman School of Public Policy on the Berkeley campus. And it's my pleasure to uh, just guide you briefly through what we're going to be doing today and then turn it over to others. Uh, this program has been conceived of as largely a West Coast tribute for Tom because Tom is being uh, feeded all over the world. So we want to do something distinctive about it. So most but not all of the uh, panelists are from the West Coast. Whereas, you know, Tom is a native of the West Coast and he's a Berkeley graduate. He's, well, I think, one of the relatively few recipients of a Berkeley baccalaureate degree to receive the Nobel Prize. There have been many recipients of Berkeley graduate degrees who've won the Nobel Prize. There are Berkeley faculty who've won the Nobel Prize. There are Berkeley former faculty and researchers who've won the Nobel Prize. But relatively small numbers received their undergraduate degree at Berkeley. And Tom holds the, that degree before doing graduate work at Harvard. Um, the program has been put together artfully by a wonderful committee of my colleagues. I want to acknowledge them. The chair of the committee is John Quigley, who is in the back. You'll hear more of him in just a minute, more from him in just a minute. Uh, John holds appointments in the Goldman School Economics Department and the Haas School. Uh, Rob Powell from the Political Science Department, who will actually chair the first panel. Rob McCoon from the Goldman School and the Bolt School of Law, who will chair the after an afternoon panel. And Rich Gilbert from the Department of Economics. Um, the way the program will work is that John Quigley will be introducing each of the panels uh, very briefly and the panel chairs. And then the panel chairs will in turn introduce the panelists and what they're going to be doing. We have, as you see from the program, uh, four main panels today. One on international relations, one on industrial organization, one on what we're call calling scary stuff, and one on micro motives and macro behavior, four different aspects of Shelley's uh, work. There will be a luncheon break around 12.30 today, uh, box lunch, which you're all welcome to uh, enjoy. And uh, some of you will also be going to a dinner this evening, which is at the Lawrence Hall of Science uh, later around 7 o'clock. Um, we are especially uh, thankful today, not only for the quality of the participants, but for the notable accomplishments of each of them. And, uh, we will have, in the course of the day, uh, four other Nobel laureates commenting on the work of Tom Schelling, a few of whom are already here. George Akerlof is in the front row from our Department of Economics. Dan McFadden, I saw a second ago, was here. He's, there he is, in the middle. And uh, also, you will uh, hear later from Ken Arrow of the Stanford Economics Department and uh, Michael Spence, who used to be at Harvard and Stanford. And we will have a Nobel laureate, I think, in the audience, not directly on one of the panels, Charles Towns, one of Berkeley's earlier recipients of, Nobel, of the Nobel Prize in Physics. So this is quite an august group. And uh, we're delighted you're all here. So uh, uh, without any further delay, let me turn it over to John Quigley, who will introduce our first panel. So my job is to introduce Robert Powell, uh, the Robeson Professor of Political Science at Berkeley. Um, uh, Robert has uh, done graduate work in international relations and economics. He's an expert in the application of game theory to international strategic issues and in particular to international conflict. Um, 
his uh, 1999 book from Princeton University Press sort of showed the way in which uh, some of these uh, um, more uh, complicated models can be used to act illuminate actual international relations and uh, problems having to do with conflict. Um, but the scariest thing I know is a series of papers that he produced in 2006 and 2007 in which he sort of showed a, a series of sufficient conditions such that perfectly rational, perfectly well-informed uh, leaders would uh, end up going to war. So it's not one of these standard things where there's asymmetric information or there's incomplete information or there's this and that. It's that the guys on both sides with full rationality in a one-shot game would find it in their interest to blow up the pie rather than to divide the pie. Uh, Robert. Thank you, John. I just wanted to remind you that the scary stuff is coming later. This is the pleasant version of conflict. Um, I'd like to introduce the, the panel uh, by um, relating two things to you. I had the pleasure of attending a symposium honoring Tom Schelling about 18 months ago at the, um, at the University of uh, Maryland, which was sponsored by the School of Public Policy public affairs there and the economics department. There are very, and there were two striking things uh, about that that happened to me that day. Um, the first one as I sat in the audience and watched the, the papers unfold was that with one or two notable exceptions, all of them focused on economic applications of some of Tom's ideas or macro sociological outcomes of micro motivations. And yet if you ask most political scientists, and especially those who are involved in international politics, what Tom's, what they think of when you mention the name Tom Schelling, they think of Tom's foundational work on arms control and nuclear deterrence theory. And I found myself thinking, here is a man who has really two bodies of work, at least two, each of which on its own seem, would merit a Nobel Prize. The second striking thing about that day is that I had the pleasure of sitting next to Roger Meyerson for much of the morning. And about halfway through the morning, Roger leaned over to me and said, you know, I think there's some chance that Tom Schelling may have saved the world. Roger, as you know, is one of this year's co-winners of the Nobel Prize. And what he meant by that was that Tom's ideas about nuclear deterrence theory and arms control had helped the Soviet Union and the United States navigate their way through the Cold War. They might have made it without the benefit of the insights drawn from Tom's work, but they might not have as well. And Tom's ideas played a very important role in shaping our thinking about uh, the events of the Cold War. The theme for this morning panel's session is the ideas about arms control and nuclear deterrence theory. Many of them grew out of what many, some call the golden age of nuclear deterrence theory, roughly the decade between the mid-1950s and the mid-1960s. And the theme for this morning is to try to look at those ideas, see how they help inform us about contemporary issues, as well as how contemporary issues challenge us in thinking about new ways and pose new questions for Tom, as well as the rest of us. It's my pleasure this morning to be joined um, on the panel with um, Professor Charles Glazer from the Harris School at the University of Chicago and uh, Professor Scott Sagan from Stanford, the political science department at Stanford. Both Charlie and Scott have written widely on national security issues and especially on issues re revolving around nuclear deterrence and um, national security. So let me try to frame my remarks before turning it over to them. Each of us will try to speak for about 15 minutes, which should leave plenty of time for discussion and comments from the floor. I want to frame my remarks around two polar opposite claims about nuclear deterrence theory that one hears now. The first is, this is not quite a quotation, but pretty close, a good paraphrase, par paraphrase is that nuclear deterrence theory is a Cold War relic that the ideas that grew out of the 
golden age of nuclear deterrence theory are obsolete. At best, if you apply them to current contemporary issues, they will lead to misleading but harmless conclusions. And at worst, they will lead to very dangerous conclusions. That's at one extreme. There must be something in the water in Cambridge, because I find um, other extremes also uh, expressed by people in Cambridge. But here comes another at the other extreme. This is a, is a quotation. If we could deter the evil empire for four decades, we can almost certainly deter today's rogue states. So deterrence work during the Cold War, it's even easier now. A second quotation, if deterrence prevented 10,000 Soviet missiles from, from reaching the United States, it baffles me as to why it wouldn't prevent 20 Chinese missiles from reaching Alaska. So on the one hand, nuclear deterrence theory is a Cold War relic. On the other hand, we don't even have to think about it because it worked in the Cold War and the deterrence was easier then than now. Um, I want to argue that, that both of these positions misunderstand some important issues. And I think in, in trying to make that argument, it will point to, to some challenges um, for us in thinking about the, the effects of the spread of nuclear weapons uh, today. Just to emphasize the point, some of those who believe that nuclear wor deterrence worked in the Cold War also go on, a few of them, to, to advocate, not exactly advocate the spread of nuclear weapons, but suggest there's a big, thick silver lining. So there are lots of, there's some good sides to the spread of nuclear weapons. And Scott uh, um, has, has um, written a book with Ken Waltz uh, debating thoroughly that, those issues. OK. To try to develop these points about the polar opposites, let me try to take you back a step. And at the risk of Tom Schelling failing me on my oral exams, pose the question, what is nuclear deterrence theory about? and highlight the, a central credibility problem at the heart that in many ways drove much of our thinking. Obviously, the advent of nuclear weapons did not eliminate political conflicts of interest. One way to think about nuclear deterrence theory is it's an effort to try to understand how political conflicts of interest play themselves out in the shadow of nuclear weapons. How do nuclear weapons change the strategic environment, change the strategic incentives, and affect who might prevail in a crisis? What are the things that affect who wins and who, who prevails, who doesn't? The chances that the thing will actually break down in, in war. At the heart of this attempt to figure out how nuclear weapons affect the incentives is a fundamental credibility problem that was surely on the horizon in the, the late 50s and perhaps was stimulating much of the thinking uh, during the golden age. Nuclear weapons clearly are incredibly destructive. Um, and then with the advent of, of uh, thermonuclear weapons, even more so. And often coming with that destructiveness is the inability to defend oneself against an adversary. So that means that I can impose very high costs on you. But in response, you can retaliate in kind, impose very high costs on me, and there's practically nothing I can do about it. In the Cold War, this was often described as a technological situation of mutually assured destruction. Both sides had survivable second strike forces. Well, the credibility problem then is you have these huge arsenals out there. The outcome is probably the end of the world. It seems like that exerts a lot of coercive pressure. How is it that states might use the other state's fear of that outcome as a way to exert coercive pressure? But the puzzle is, since it's so bad, and since if I carry it out, I'm going to suffer retaliation in kind, and that cost of that retaliation is worse than any other political issue at stake between us, I cannot credibly threaten to deliberately impose the sanction. Sometimes this is described as two scorpions in a bottle. Sometimes it's described as how do you make the threat of mutual suicide credible. But the problem is a fundamental one of credibility. Notice I'm not saying that one should, a state should use this to exert coercive pressure. I'm saying how can we understand whether states can use it, and if they can, what will affect the dynamics of it? And maybe they can't. Maybe these things completely cancel each other out, and there is effectively uh, minimal risk. <laughs>
One of Tom Schilling's huge contributions was to solve this credibility problem and thereby explain how states could exert coercive pressure in the shadow of threats and sanctions that are inherently incredible. And the solution that now has been taught to many generations of undergraduates, Arms and Influence, which was published in 1967, is now, is currently, and I think has always been in print since it came out as, I believe, Strategy of Conflict has. The solution was that states could make threats that leave something to chance. That states could take steps during a crisis that would entail some risk, not that anyone del would deliberately impose the sanction, after all, that is incredible, but that that sanction would result from unintended consequences, from events spiraling out of control, from um, accidents or as sometimes Tom wrote in, in um, Arms and Influence from, and his analogy of brinkmanship, as you walk farther out the brink, it becomes ste steeper, loose gravel underfoot, gusty winds overhead, a chance of slipping and falling. When I talk to my students and teach this in, in, to the undergraduates here at Berkeley, what happens if you're walking down uh, Telegraph Avenue? Do you want to depend on the rationality of the people you meet? Um, accidents can happen. And what states can do then is bid up the risk and attempt to um, exert coercive pressure in that way. Crises, in other words, become a contest of resolve in which each exerts coercive pressure by taking steps that, in effect, make it more and more dangerous until one of three outcomes, in the simplest version anyway, only three outcomes, you back down, I back down, or this is a real risk and disaster happens and we both, all of us, pay, pay the horrible cost of events spiraling out of control. All right. I think there are some auction theorists in the audience, so let me suggest that, that another way of thinking about this, crises, in other words, become a kind of auction. In that auction, don't, the bids are not denominated in dollars. They're denominated in risk. And think of a state's resolve as the maximum, not dollar amount, but risk they would be willing to run. If they knew by running that risk, they would prevail. And then you can think of crises and brinkmanship crises as a kind of auction. There are, of course, many different kinds of auctions. So the standard one, an English auction, the price is bid up until someone bids one price, no one else bids, the price is awarded to the guy who bid the highest price, that person pays the price she bid, and no one else pays anything. A Dutch auction, the price begins very high and comes down until someone says, I'll take it. That person pays, no one else pays, they walk away. But there are second price auctions. Um, so in a second price auction, the bidding continues. It eventually stops. Some, the, the person who bid the highest amount wins, but they only pay the next highest price. And that has some very nice um, properties if you're an auction theorist, and, and some of that was also uh, recognized by a, a Nobel Prize to... Uh, to Vickery. Let me mention one more, an all-pay auction. So in an all-pay auction, everyone pays the price they bid. So even losers pay the price they bid. And now think about brinkmanship. You can think of brinkmanship as an all-pay second price auction where the prices, the bids, are denominated in risk. Bidding happens. We bid up the risk. At the end of the day, the auction wins. The, the auction stops. Somebody has been higher than the next guy. We spin a spinner. They bid a risk. If that risk is realized, disaster is imposed. These guys don't win. We take all their money. Enthusiastic here for added emphasis. We take all their money away, impose a high cost on them. Alternatively, if the, re the risk isn't win, the guy who bid the biggest risk wins. He takes the prize. So sec. Why is it all pay? Because if the risk is realized, both, both guys pay. Why is it second price? Well, who defines the maximum risk? What's well, the first person to bail out? It's the second highest bid. He bails out, and that defines who will win. Now that I've backed in and filled in some machinery, I can get to an insight that Tom had very early on without any of this machinery. And that's the key thing about crises. What makes them dangerous is risk. If you think about an all-price auction, imagine that we know each other's levels of resolve. There's no uncertainty at all. So I know how much risk you're willing to bid. You know how much risk I'm willing to bid. 
bad news for me if it turns out you're willing to bid more, but what are the effects of that? I would never engage in this action. Why? Because no matter how far I go, if I know you're willing to bid more than I am, you'll be willing to go a little bit higher. But it's a costly contest for me even if I lose. And so if I can't win and it's costly to participate in it, I ought to not get into it. If you don't have uncertainty, there will be no crises. And as Tom put it in Arms and Influence 40 years ago, the essence of crisis is its uncertainty, its unpredictability. OK, I've talked long enough, so let me begin to summarize. And I come back to these two points, these polar opposite views. Deterrence theory is a Cold War relic, no insight into contemporary issues. Or secondly, basically, it's the same outcome as we got in the Cold War. And from the United States perspective, that seemed pretty good. If you think about this idea of brinkmanship in an auction, it's clear why those are both misguided. First, what about deterrence theory as a way of understanding how conflicts of interest play themselves out? Well, I don't have time to go into it, and other people on the panel are more expert in it than I. But if you look at broadly the conflict between India and Pakistan in Kargil, it looks very much like a brinkmanship crisis. People are bidding up risk, and the fear of escalation is exerting uh, strong pressure. Let me also suggest that if you look at some of the arguments made about rogue states, about the fears that they would impose, they're made in the spirit that deterrence theory is obsolete, but they're sort of making the opposite point. The reason, one of the major reasons the United States is concerned about other states acquiring nuclear weapons is because it would inhibit, especially rogue states, inhibit American foreign policy flexibility and especially the ability to decide to impose a regime change through the use of force. Fundamentally, the concern is if the other guy gets nuclear weapons, the United States will be the deterree rather than the deterrer. That's probably bad news for policymakers sitting in Washington. But it isn't about how these ideas help us understand how things, conflicts of interest will play out. And in that, indeed, you sort of think they play out this way. Usually over regional issues, regional powers have bigger stakes. And especially if what's at stake is whether that regional regime will stay in power or not. Usually, the, the CIA estimated, I think, the, the chance that Saddam Hussein would be most likely to use WMD if he had them was in the event of an effort to topple him. So the idea that the balance of resolve would favor a regional state seems to apply. Um, and so the arguments used against uh, advocating or suggesting um, the obsoleteness it, it seems uh, misguided. But then, if it's still good theory, why aren't the predictions good? Why aren't the, why shouldn't we sleep con peacefully at night since deterrence worked so well in the Cold War? Uncertainty. The second half of the Cold War, 30-second history, looks very different than the first half. Up through the Cuban Missile Crisis, it sure seems the countries were playing, the, the, the United States and the Soviet Union, through a series of crises, were figuring out who was willing to run risk over what, more risk over what issues. The sanguine view of the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union re relating to nuclear weapons usually is sort of the set, looks back only at the second half of the Cold War. Well, as nuclear weapons spread to India and Pakistan, they don't have much experience dealing with crises of Cargill, for example, where they've somehow already worked out the balance of resolve. Who, fa what, who would the balance of resolve favor between the United States and the Soviet Union over the independence of Taiwan? I don't know. Many people think they know. And if you, but if you solicit opinions, they think they know, but they seem to know different things. That suggests to me there's some fundamental uncertainty, and that makes deterrence theory, uh, deterrence <clears throat> escalation dangerous. And finally, off the headlines now, Iran, should they acquire um, nuclear weapons? Well, fill in your blank what about your favorite Middle Eastern state. How confident are you that they would have a sense of who is willing to run more risk over what? So in that sense, the ideas that, that Tom illuminated in terms of brinkmanship guide us, help us think about the way conflicts of interest may play out, may help us navigate the coming um, era, but they don't make it e we can't rest quietly in the night just because things played out well in the Cold War.
So with that, let me uh, turn it over and say thank you to Charlie Glazer for joining the panel. Charlie. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Tom Schelling had a big impact on my thinking and my uh, enthusiasm for these issues, and so I'm very glad to be at this um, ceremony. Um, I was a graduate student, and um, he was on my dissertation committee. And I actually want to tell a couple quick, very quick stories about my, most, my early experiences with Tom, and then I'll actually try to get to the substance. And they've given us very little time. Um, so I was working on missile defense, and the question of very good missile defenses, actually right before um, then President Reagan suggested the idea of Star Wars. And so I was involved in th trying to learn the technology and the radars and all these complicated things and thinking about, you know, how, how, what, what, how do we really think about these problems? And I would go in, and, and I remember one meeting in particular, and Tom Schelling asked me, well, had I thought about the problem of the camel, camels carrying, um, walking over mountains? Or had I thought about the problem of the rowboats submerged below the water? And I thought, no, I haven't thought about that, and why would I? Um, but after a short reflection, it became clear to me that, um, what he was getting at, and um, he was telling me, don't always focus on the obvious part of the question, and don't always let other people, don't follow the way that other people have framed a problem for you. Make sure you start on your own and decide what's most important, um, which turns out to be very good advice, although very hard to follow, because it's always easier to let other people frame the problem for you. Um, in some ways, I think a more telling example, I went to many, um, or more than a handful of workshops and job talks when I was at Harvard, um, and they were always interesting and, you know, sort of not unlike most that I've been to since. Although um, Tom asked questions at two of these, and they really left a remarkable impression on me because what happened was the talk had gone on for most of the session, and it seemed like a good talk, and people asked all the good, normal questions. And then Tom raised his hand and asked his question, and he slowly laid out what his problem was with the talk. And all of a sudden, the talk looked really bad. Not mean bad, just bad. There was a problem, a serious problem with the talk. And the speaker understood this and was you know, sort of deflated in the way that you would normally be if you'd missed something important. But everybody else was also a little worried and very impressed because we hadn't seen it either. <laughs> and all of a sudden it was obvious. And the nature of the insight was an obvious insight. And um, I actually think that in many ways characterizes what's most important about his work. There's the very fancy stuff that people are still working on. And Bob, obviously, I mean, to his credit, not in, you know, was working on very fancy parts of it. And people are still modeling the complexities. But maybe some of the most important insights are ones that are basic and accessible and don't require much more than just the basic insights they offered. Um, but they are insights that are very hard to come by because they are insights that people hadn't come to until Tom Schelling made them available. And then they are actually, they seem like the right way to do it. Um, so I actually thought today, um, at the danger of being a little bit off current topics, I would go through a number of those types of insights, um, many of which are still relevant. I'm not going to have a chance to make all the connections, but some of which are obviously immediately real irrelevant. So that's what I would like to do. Um, the first is, and I can't really cover the whole subject, but I'm going to try to pierce it, is just the logic of mutual vulnerability, which Bob talked about some, and the issues and the problems of credibility. And I'm just going to take a slightly different tact on it. Um, people usually think of nuclear war as being an all-out war or no war. It's either peace or all-out war. Um, and Schelling explained that understanding limited war is actually very important. It's understanding both for understanding deterrence, um, because a lot of deterrence has to do with limited use. Um, it's very important for avoiding all-out war, and it's also very important for deterring conventional war. So the idea that it's not all or nothing um, is a, is a lot of where the hard work happened, I think, um, and where Shel many of Tom Schelling's insights are especially valuable. And I'm going to just try to illustrate this with a couple examples. Um, so the issue then of limited nuclear options, which is to say how you would use nuclear weapons in a limited way, um, becomes a very important part of nuclear strategy. Most people tend to think of strat nuclear strategy as when do you launch the all-out attack, and that's consistent with the all-or-nothing view. Um, in a lot of ways, this doesn't make sense when you think about it. Um, and so why would this be? Um, first is for credibility. If you want to have a credible threat, one is to have a, a threat that leaves something to chance, but the other is different, which is a small threat, which is more credible. This then raises the question um, of how do you think about using nuclear weapons in a limited way? And many people are very put off by the idea of even thinking about this. But Challing's argument from the beginning was that we might actually face these circumstances, and it's important to think them through ahead of time, not at the moment that you might have to deal with them. 
So how do you think about limited nuclear options? And consistent with what Bob Powell was saying, the key to a limited option in Schelling's view was the, the risk that it generates of a larger war, not the damage that attack itself does. And this is actually very different, not totally, but very different than how we have tended to think about military, the use of military force before that. Because typically you would think, what can I accomplish with a limited attack? What do I destroy? What's the battlefield effect of that use? And the point was that's mostly, if not completely, the wrong way to think about limited nuclear use. Because a limited attack in the nuclear sense is about what will come next and what it tells you about what could come next, not what, about what just happened on the battlefield. And there are very important implications, because in this kind of tacit bargaining, you might attack different targets and use nuclear <coughs> weapons differently than if you were trying to accomplish something on the battlefield. So it was actually very important to be clear about that limited use. And so this argument goes well beyond the idea that you need to have limited options for credibility, but to understand really the nature of tacit bargaining in limited use. A second example concerns nuclear strategy in the 1960s, which some of you probably have read about and some of you were there for the formation of. Um, in the early 60s, the US chose a policy that was called the No Cities Policy under Secretary of Defense McNamara. Um, and the idea was that the United States was going to first attack cities, I mean, first attack forces and not attack Soviet cities. And this doctrine then um, was rather different than what had been described before and was considered revolutionary in its way. But Tom emphasized that there are two very important components to so-called no cities that are fundamentally different. And they really come to what we, what, about the nature of use. One was what you might call the counterforce or the damage limitation part, attacking Soviet forces so they couldn't attack you in retaliation. But the second part of no cities was not attacking cities making sure the Soviet cities survived so they would have an incentive not to attack you. So the counterforce part is about their capabilities, but the no cities, or the cities part, as he put it, was about their incentives to not attack you. Um, and these are very different ways of thinking about something that could be described the same way, which is if you could say, attack their forces, don't attack their cities, two very different stories depending upon how you look at it. And importantly, attacking forces in the counterforce logic only made sense if you could actually protect yourself, if you could destroy enough of the force that you were less vulnerable. But the city's part, it didn't matter if you could protect yourself because that wasn't why you were attacking their forces. You were preserving hostages. You were maintaining incentives. And very importantly, when you really looked at it and you looked at the no cities or the city's part of it, there was no reason to even attack forces because you weren't really protecting yourself. And so it raises the question, why attack forces in the first place? If you're not attacking cities, maybe you should attack something else besides forces. And if the whole idea of attacking is to communicate um, restraint on the one hand, but also willingness to in increase risk, maybe forces just aren't, just aren't the issue at all. So that's a very different way of thinking about incentives and limited use. Um, and I'll give a third example, and I can tell I'm going to have to go faster than I want. But a third example, which is related to all this, is about the pace of war. The con a standard way to think about nuclear war was that counterforce wars, the wars against forces, could be slow and controlled. And that a limited war then would be a counterforce, like a for an attack against forces. But the countervalues, or city attacks, would be fast. Once, once you attack cities, it was going to be an all-out war. And this is a very standard view of nuclear war. And Schelling's argument was that that's actually probably exactly wrong, or almost exactly wrong, because the, a counterforce war, which is thought about in military terms, has lots of incentives to go quickly. If you don't attack their forces, they may attack yours, and so on and so forth. But a city's war, or a countervalue war, should go slowly. Because if you have survivable forces, there's no incentive to attack their cities quickly. This is a very important point, because it means if you ever get into a war, and you understand how it works, and you have the right kind of forces, that war, if it happens at all, which is not a good idea, but if it happens at all or has a logic to it, it should go slowly and carefully and communicate this kind of competition and risk taking that Bob Powell was talking about not be an explosive war. And it's the counterforce wars that will have the other character. Well, the bad news about much of this is that even though I'm considering it basic, because when I heard this, even though I hadn't known it, it became obviously true to me. Um, U.S. nuclear policy adopted very little of it. And so Tom Schelling offered us these great insights, but he didn't transform uh, 
U.S. nuclear policy with them. Um, but nevertheless, I think they're extremely valuable. And as we, there are going to be nuclear weapons around likely for a long time, and I think this is a profoundly important way to think about them. Um, and some of it, even though it's uncomfortable, um, strikes me as very much to the point. I want to, I think I've got about five or six minutes. I'm going to take, take three other topics pretty quickly. Um, a second really major area, the first being all these issues about limited nuclear options, it's about accidents. People, and Scott is an expert on accidents, and none of this disagrees all with, with his work, although it's a little, a little different spirit. But much of the work on accidents, and still tends to think of accidents as a technical problem. Somehow the forces get launched. Or somehow somebody takes one and uses it in an unauthorized way. Tom Schelling made the point that accidents actually are much more closely related to the incentives in force structure than that view of accidents suggests. And it's actually time pressure and the pressure to use forces quickly that may lay at the core of many accidental or, in, or poor uses. And that these time pressures are the result of the vulnerability of forces. Because the reason that you, when you think about this the right way, that you, or his way, and I think it is the right way, that you might have to use forces quickly is because your own forces are vulnerable. And when your own forces are vulnerable, you may have to act on very little warning. You may have to act on a report that's inaccurate, but if you don't act, you won't have an opportunity um, to act at all. So you may launch a large war because you think you're under attack, or you believe you've suffered a large attack, and in fact, that's not the case. But if you have to act quickly, you don't have the time to figure that out. So a key, not the only issue, but a key to avoiding accidents is actually to configure forces in a way that provide leaders with the time to learn the situation they're, about the situation they're in and take the time to figure out what their best options are. And so accidents, in this view, are actually closely related to a variety of other features of nuclear forces, including incentives for preemptive attack and crisis stability. They're not exactly the same, but they're, they're intertwined much more and also much more susceptible um, to cooperative solutions than a purely technical view of accidents is. The third thing I want to talk about is arms control. Tom Schelling in the mid-50s with some others, but very much in the lead, redefined how we understand arms control. And I'd like to just make a few basic points about it. The first point, or maybe a, a foundational point that they made, is the distinction between arms control and disarmament. Um, disarmament was really about getting rid of weapons, and zero was just, at, and arms, arms control was about getting rid of weapons, and zero was just a point on a continuum um, that was disarmament. But it was, they were all one and the same. Well, very much in the spirit of thinking about incentives, um, and, in the, in, the, in the development of forces and in, um, in the use of force, arms control from this, uh, from this perspective was very different. And it was actually about not getting rid of weapons, but about changing states' incentives to use weapons. And it can lead to drastically different results in terms of what you would like to negotiate and whether you think you're pursuing successful policies. So this modern theory of arms control led to a variety of very different insights. Um, First, it established what are the classic three objectives of arms control, and it's worth stating them because they're actually very powerful. The first is to reduce the probability of war. The second, to reduce the cost if war occurs. And the third, to reduce the cost of preparing for war. So this is, this is very good guidance. And the question is then, what forces would enable you to achieve these objectives? And I think maybe the, the one that's most interesting in a way is reducing the cost of war. Because even here, the arguments very quickly came back to incentives. Because there are two ways to reduce the cost of war. One is to make forces so small that an all-out war does less damage. That was actually considered to be extremely difficult because of the damage nuclear weapons can do, but also because they were already large and getting larger by the 50s and into the 60s. But the second way to reduce the cost of war is by keep, keeping it limited. So that sides have the ability to annihilate each other, but choose not to. And so you could think about arms control agreements that didn't reduce weapons below the level at which countries could be completely destroyed, but once again, created incentives for restraint and opportunities for decision making that allowed a war to be limited and thereby reduce its costs. And so the focus of these, uh, of the first two objectives, reducing the probability of war and reducing the cost, was very much on the incentives and not on the capabilities. And the question was then, how do you structure forces to accomplish those? Uh, those subsidiary goals. And this is excellent advice, and some of it was pursued during the Cold War and some of it wasn't. 
But as we think about arms control today, it may be between medium-sized powers like India and Pakistan, or if we think in the future about the United States and China, um, or a variety of other cases, this will often provide good guidance. And I'll say two further things about it. One is they pointed out that this way of thinking about arms control runs very much parallel to standard force planning. In other words, arms control should be seen as complementary to and not in competition with standard force planning and strategy. If you think about those objectives, reducing the probability of war, the cost, and the cost of planning, those are things that we do in force planning and just straight, strat straight unilateral strategy as well as we do cooperatively. And one shouldn't be preferred over the other. There are options that are available. They sometimes complement each other. Sometimes cooperation should have a greater weight. Sometimes competition and unilateral policy should have greater weight. But they're both largely, not entirely parallel, but they're largely means to the same ends, and they deserve comparable um, weight. This is not fully internalized today, but it was not uh, in, in people's thinking. It certainly was not. Um, it, they were seen as almost, in this, you know, Bob was talking about polar opposites, very, very opposite approaches um, before this work. But I think, it, it, once again, it's very insightful advice. And then the final point on, um, on arms control, but maybe the one operationally that people think of as being most important, and it follows from what I've said, is that arms control should not be about numbers, but it should be about types of weapons, because particularly with countries that have large forces, the incentives in the forces to use and to restrain have much more to do with the types of weapons and their capabilities than the numbers. So this led to advice about limiting forces that can destroy other forces, because those are the ones that create the time pressures, the preemptive incentives, that maybe the doubts about capabilities, as well as the political competition between states. But also defenses, because defenses in many ways are like forces that attack forces. They undermine an adversary's retaliatory capability that may work less well in a second strike than in a first strike. They create all kinds of pressures. So um, thinking about types of forces, it's a general guidance how they survive, whether they have to go on alert to survive, whether they look like they're preparing to attack when you're making them more survivable, um, but also whether they're designed to attack. And then fifth, I think I'm out of time, but I'll just mention the, uh, or fourth rather, the fourth topic, which is disarmament itself. Um, this is, is relevant. Um, there are a number of very um, important people now that are focusing on disarmament. Um, it's also often seen related still very much to arms control. So on disarmament, um, many people have the impression, although many, I think, not people who think strategically don't, but that basically if you can disarm, the issue of war goes away. Because if arms go are gone, then you can't fight, so you solve the war problem when you solve the weapons problem. Um, Tom Schelling in the 50s, late 50s and early 60s explained this is just, I mean, it is sort of obviously naive, but he explained how naive it is in the sense that you can have a war coming out of disarmament. You can have an arms race that leads straight to war. And that many of the incentives and many of the kinds of issues that you think about when you have weapons are the same kind of in pressures and incentives you think about in disarmament. You think, can I gain by building quickly? Can I build quickly and destroy the other side's forces? Can I, the analogy is, can I build quickly and destroy the other side's ability to rearm? Um, and so he laid out a program for the requirements for stable disarmament, which included um, a variety of deterrence arguments as well as other stability arguments. So states needed to be able to rearm equally quickly I won't agree to an agreement if you can rearm more quickly than I can, or vice versa. And our mutual ability to rearm will deter. We need to have a variety of ways to have forces be rearm be survivable, because a small lead is even more dangerous if you can destroy my ability to rearm. It's actually not so dangerous if you can't, so on and so forth. So disarmament turns out to be at least as complicated and, um, as an armed world, and actually much harder to design which isn't to say it wouldn't be a good idea, and there are a lot of reasons that don't have to do with bilateral relations about why disarmament might be desirable, but it's important to realize that it's, you don't solve the problem of war or competition by getting rid of the weapons. Um, and there is a naughty problem that Tom didn't focus on as much, which is the relationship between politics and arming and which comes first. Is it the solution to the political problem or the solution to the arming problem that leads um, to disarmament? But let me stop there. I tried to cover the waterfront. I think it's pretty obvious how many of those um, issues are translated into relations between recent proliferators, but also the United States may face um, in future competition. Thank you, John. Thank you. Uh, many here today will cite the Nobel Prize as the sign uh, of Tom Schelling's uh, importance as an intellectual 
and a, an economist. Uh, I want to start by suggesting a second measure, which is the degree to which a noun, his name, has become an adjective. If you Google Schelling-esque today, or at least if you did it yesterday, as I did, you will find 229 references immediately pop up. And what is impressive is not the number of references to Schelling-esque. It's not the number, after all, some of these, I didn't count them, uh, were to the German philosopher Friedrich Wilhelm Joseph von Schelling. So it's not just the number, but it's the diversity of subjects which, in which people have made Tom Schelling-esque references. We expect to find Schelling-esque comments to be influential about articles about US space policy, about Russian military strategy, or about competitive negotiations in trade. But who would have predicted that Schelling-esque tipping points would help explain the changing fashions in what shoes teenage girls are wearing this year? Or that Schelling-esque focal points would be used to help understand Captain Kirk's starship enterprise maneuvers in the Star Trek series, according to at least, I'm not kidding you, a website called the First Church of Shanterology, William Shantner's um, fan club. Don't worry, I will limit myself today to comments about nuclear weapons strategy and comments that were Schelling-esque and indeed derived directly from Schelling, saying a bit about why they were influential during the Cold War, but also how they are used and, in my judgment, often abused today. I'm going to focus on three. First, the threat that leaves something to chance. As Bob Powell has already noted, this was Tom Schelling's innovative solution to how to have credibility in a condition in which the ultimate action that you are threatening is inherently not credible. The metaphor in his first book is two climbers tied together, one who wants to intimidate the other by seeming about to fall over the edge. But if the brink is clearly marked and provides a firm footing, no loose, no loose pebbles, no gusts of wind, neither can pose any risk to the other. It is the uncertainty at the brink and that you're willing to take risks as you approach that brink that adds an element of credibility. And the Cold War example often cited uh, is the idea of a plane during the Berlin airlift buzzing another plane. The pilot does not intend to crash into the other plane, but is creating an inherent risk. I worry today, however, that such ideas are too easily, or rather too readily, applied to similar brinksmanship crises. And let me reference here the recent example that Bob Powell also did about the Cargill episode in 1999 in which Pakistani armed forces disguised as Mujahideen uh, guerrilla fighters uh, crossed the line of control into Indian-held Kashmir, putting uh, artillery and armed fire onto Indian positions below and causing the first uh, war, at least according to the Correlates of War Project measures, between two nuclear-armed states in 1999. Neil Jock from Lawrence Livermore and here at Berkeley, uh, citing both Tom and, and Bob, refers to this, as Bob did, as a co competition in risk taking. The war in 1999, he writes, proceeded very much as one would expect in a deterrent relationship with both sides practicing brinksmanship. Quite literally, brinksmanship, I guess, given how high up they were uh, on the mountains above cargo. And he therefore uses another analogy that, that Tom was fond of of two drivers driving towards each other, two teenagers, seeing which one will swerve and what's the balance of, uh, of resolve. Now the problem here, I think, is that we should understand that the Pakistani military took this action without full understanding or awareness of what they were doing on the part of their civilian leadership. Indeed, we know now that they alerted their nuclear-capable missiles at their test ranges without telling civilian authorities that they were doing so. And there are reports from the Washington Post 
that at least senior authorities within the Pakistani military developed plans to hide Pakistani nuclear weapons in Afghanistan where they would not be found or targeted by Indian forces, but obviously might be found and captured by Al Qaeda or the Taliban. Civilians ordered a retreat in the cargo war, but the military said that there was no risk and objected, and indeed that was one of the, major, one of the most important factors that led to the eventual coup that brought President Musharraf to power. Now my point here is that in Pakistan and other new potential proliferators, the game of chicken analogy needs to be adopted in a different way, that it is not just two cars going at each other seeing which has more resolve, but rather two cars in which there are multiple people putting their foot on the brake, a second per person putting the foot on the accelerator, a third person in the back seat giving instructions, and it's not clear how that car is going to behave. In Bob Powell's analogy to auctions, the problem is not just that we don't, that one state does not know the other's risk bid, it's that the state, the government does not know, it does not know its own risk bid in any serious way. And when you have such problems of civil military relations and uncertainty about yourself, it seems to me that one has to be still using the idea that it's a threat that leaves something to chance, recognize that there is chance in your own behavior and that you may misjudge yourself enormously. This is, I think, a point that gets lost when we too easily remember that successive spins of the roulette wheel during the Cold War did not result in a disaster and it could in these other conditions more easily than I think we sometimes estimate. The second point I want to make is about the reciprocal fear of surprise attack, another very important concept that Tom's creativity helped us understand. In chapter nine of Strategy and Conflict, he built a model to explain how two rational actors could initiate a war that neither intended and neither wanted through a mutual fear of surprise attack. And as he often did, he starts with an, a human analogy to bring us into the um, more complicated military problem. If I go downstairs, he writes, to investigate a noise at night with a gun in my hand and find myself face to face with a burglar who has a gun in his hand, there's a danger of an outcome that neither of us desires. Even if he prefers to leave quietly, and I wish him to, there's danger that he may think I want to shoot and shoot first. There's a danger that he may think that I think he wants to shoot, or he may just think that I think that he thinks that I want to shoot, and so on. Self-defense is ambiguous when one is trying to preclude being shot in self-defense. Now what was not, I think, sufficiently appreciated in some of the subsequent literature on this subject was how Tom Schelling argued in this model that one way that, a gov that this problem could be produced was when governments adjusted their balance between type one and type two errors in the warning systems that they deployed. That as you thought there was an increased likelihood that another state might attack you first and that likelihood went up, you adjusted your reactions to warnings in ways so that a, you could accept one kind of error because you thought that that kind of error was less likely and that you would actually deploy warning systems according to that particular logic. Such a warning system, Schelling writes, such a warning system is the rational mechanical counterpart to our nervousness in facing a burglar. Well, I want to report here that I thought I had discovered at one point precisely this phenomenon. And one thing that is wonderful about reading Schelling's work is when you do historical research, you know what to look for. It gives you clues about what in the mass of archival work or studying things you might want to investigate. And I discovered when I was working on a book called The Limits of Safety that the United States Defense Condition System, the alerting system, the so-called DEFCON system, 
included placing at higher DEF CONs a US radar system called the Cobra Dane radar, a phased array ra radar deployed in uh, the Aleutians that was normally used to look at arms control uh, to measure Soviet test missiles being launched into their test sites. And at higher DEF CONs, that missile was taken off its arms control radar purposes and put onto the early warning system tied into NORAD so that we could have a better or have more information, not better information, that we have more information on which to make a judgment about launching a preemptive and or launch on warning or second strike. And I thought, aha, I've discovered that mechanical evidence. I therefore wrote this up, took it to people in Washington and discovered much to my pleasure as a citizen, my dismay as a, as a uh, scholar, that that particular radar was actually more effective than our normal radar systems. It actually reduced the amount of error and it was a very positive thing that we used one of our better, more advanced radars for arms control purposes during peacetime and would tie it in because it actually helped, I believe, with the overall warning system. Um, so I was wrong, but Schelling's broader point was certainly right. And indeed, thinking today about your earlier comments, um, perhaps the influence on Tom Schelling on arms control had some uh, impact on why this system was designed better than what we would have normally anticipated. But his point is broader and stands as well and is too often ignored today. And there's a emerging literature about national missile defense. When is it helpful? When is it not? Should it be deployed in the United States or in Alaska or in Poland or in Czechoslovakia or the, the Czech Republic uh, today? What about Japanese plans to deploy missile defense or now Indian plans to deploy missile defense? And most of this work is very technical in nature. What are the footprints of missiles? What are the technical capabilities? Can it detect uh, decoys or not? And very rarely, indeed, I have not found any references in this growing literature, will you find Schelling-esque analysis of type one and type two errors and how to judge them under these different conditions. And the resulting potential risk of reciprocal fear of surprise attack especially in an era in which there is great interest in preemption and preventive war, is, I think, very unfortunate. And so I hope that others analyzing these problems will take a more Schelling-esque approach, because we cannot make good judgments about missile defense deployments until we think about their interaction to potential launch doctrines in response. And lastly, and I'll conclude on this, I want to make a point about commitment traps. Schelling in Arms and Influence makes a point that if you want to make a credible commitment, you have to, quote, get yourself into a position where you cannot fail to react as we said we would, where you just cannot help it, where you would feel obliged by some overwhelming cost of not reacting in the manner that we had declared. And there are many passages in both Strategy of Conflict and Arms and Influence describe the art of commitment, how difficult it is, and how often people do it by both actions and by words. Ich bin ein Berliner was not just a statement of Kennedy's commitment to the people of Berlin, it raised the commitment, it raised the stakes in the future had he ever contemplated backing away from that commitment if there was a Soviet incursion. Kennedy's statement in October 1962, that if a single missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere occurs, it will be treated as a Soviet attack on the United States and would result in a full retaliatory response, not only reflected existing inflexible plans, but created increased likelihood that those plans would be implemented because reputation and credibility would be at stake. Now, there's a whole literature that's developed in the past few decades about how commitment works with respect to audience costs, how democracies may be able to do, uh, may behave differently in terms of their credible commitments because of democratic uh, costs that leaders face. I think of Jim Fearon's work or Kenny Schultz's work. There's an emerging literature 
mostly by Jessica Weeks on how some autocratic regimes still have audience costs, especially if they have uh, military regimes that can potentially, or military units that can potentially um, overwhelm the leader. I wanted to turn to one modern example and then conclude, which is the current US policy of threatening to use nuclear weapons if another country uses chemical or biological weapons against us. When the president says that we might use nuclear weapons if a state uses chemical or biological weapons, what does this truly signify? Many people who are opposed to that doctrine, which is our current US nuclear doctrine, say, well, this is bad because it hurts our, hurts our non-proliferation policy. If we need nuclear weapons to deter chemical, biological weapons, uh, don't other countries that don't have nuclear weapons also need to develop nuclear weapons to deter their neighbors with chemical and biological weapons? And there are other people who say, well, no, we need that, because if we abandon that, that would hurt deterrence of such states, because we don't have chemical and biological weapons ourselves with which to make a reciprocal response. And it seems to me that both of those arguments are missing the essential point about commitment, which is that while it may be true that nuclear threats in an effort to deter chemical or biological weapons might add to deterrence because it would make a president more likely to have to follow through if chemical or biological weapons were used. That is both what adds to the deterrent, but it also increases the risk that if the deterrent fails, we would feel necessary to use nuclear weapons under those conditions. And therefore, in I would argue that unless you believe that that asymmetric deterrent will work 100% of the time, you should consider this particular kind of threat that's in our current doctrine as raising the risk that we would use nuclear weapons. And I've thought for quite a long time that among the more likely conditions under which nuclear weapons could be used are not just the Kargils and the Pakistans or a terrorist, but also a US president who, without thinking through the shelling us consequences, made statements in the name of deterrence for the sake of deterrence and found that that strategy failed. And that, to me, would be the ultimate unfortunate consequences of not listening to Tom Schelling. Thank you. So I'd, I'd like to open the floor up. Tom, would you like to respond to anything? Yeah, I have a couple of comments. In 1961, I was developing a crisis game for Washington in which I thought the main purpose was to explore the role of the Strategic Air Command and its alert status and things of that sort. And I got two generals from the Strategic Air Command to come to Washington to talk with me and my partner. <clears throat> and at that time, we had early warning ballistic missile radar, and the Strategic Air Commander had publicly announced that he didn't believe in that kind of radar and that he would never launch on that kind of warning. But then he explained there were other kinds of warning on which he would launch. And what I discovered was that if you launched SAC, and it turned out to be a false alarm, you were without any backup for more than 24 hours because the planes had to turn around. If they hadn't flown their whole distance, they had too much fuel on board. And if they tried to land, they would damage their undercarriage and couldn't take off until they were repaired. And all the crew were fatigued. And therefore, uh, I said, but I thought you always had backup. They said, we have backup, but the backup are not for the high priority targets. They're for the targets that are left over when the alert force finishes its job. And I said, OK, if you face this dilemma, you think you have warning, and you don't know whether it's a false alarm or a genuine alarm, might you launch part of the force, keeping the rest in reserve so that 
if it's a false alarm, you've still got at least half the force ready to go in case you were being spoofed in order to fatigue the strategic air command. Well, these two generals sat there for 20 or 30 minutes talking to each other about how would you launch part of the force. One said, we could launch odd-numbered, but not even-numbered wings, or we could launch odd-numbered, but not even-numbered aircraft. And how else might you launch half the force, keeping half in return? And after about 20 minutes, I realized that it had never occurred to them that a possible thing to do in case of slightly believable, but not wholly believable warning might be to split the difference and launch part of the force. And they told me they were going back to uh, Omaha and, and think about this one. Just a reminder, the scary stuff is coming this <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> Let me open the floor up to comments or questions. John? Could, could, could any of you comment on the applicability or the difference in the applicability of these theories in circumstances where there's one state and there's a bunch of guys who really aren't a state or that are somehow loosely connected to a state or maybe several states? So, all three? Non-state non actors. Um, one, it's, it's obvious it's, it's the thing that distinguishes the, the state from the non-state problem is what, how hard it is to determine, or the differences in deterring non-state actors. Um, many non-state actors actually have things that they value, and so one way that people have tried to extend these arguments, although I don't think it's with much confidence, is to, put, is to threaten those, what, the, what those actors value. Um, and so it may not be the homeland, but it may be because they don't have a state, but it may be pieces of territory or religious sites or the, the, the doctrine itself may turn out to be more provocative than the value of the return. But that's the way that the people have tried to actually extend this, the straight up deterrence argument, I think. Uh, um, um, let me take a, a, a separate, a different uh, stance on this. Um, there, there is a a new kind of problem that, w that we have. Um, it may have existed in minor ways in the past, but the interaction between two states' maneuvers and bargaining and military operations in a crisis and the risk that weapons could fall into the hands of terrorists was, I think, not well thought through because it wasn't as serious a risk during the Cold War as it is today. In Pakistan, for example, the Pakistani military, in order to keep weapons away from the hands of uh, non-state groups, keeps their weapons under normal peacetime circumstances, under lock and key. Um, the locks, but not the keys, helped, helped by United States technology that we've given to them. Um, and keep the warheads away from the delivery system. That, however, makes them more vulnerable in a crisis to an Indian attack because the Indians know what, where Pakistani major bases are. And the kinds of things that you do to make them less vulnerable to a terrorist creates signatures that Indian intelligence and American intelligence can pick up. In a crisis, therefore, the Pakistani military has every incentive, or not every incentive, has incentives to take their weapons out from those storage sites and put them out into the field at hidden sites, less well guarded, so they create fewer <laughs> signatures. That reduces the vulnerability to an Indian attack, but increases the vulnerability to terrorist theft, either from an internal actor with helping a terrorist or a pure organization attacking a site that's been seen by them but not see, seen by them on the ground but not seen by overhead uh, reconnaissance. And I think we haven't thought through the full implications of this, what I call a, the vulnerability invulnerability paradox with respect to terrorists. Um, it's something that uh, I've reminded friends in the Indian government more than once is one more reason why you should resolve the problems in Kashmir and not threaten to use military force against Pakistan because their reaction against your threats is to do things that creates a different threat. 
I, I guess I would just take a slightly different facet. If the issue is can you deter a non-state actor who somehow has acquired some sort of nuclear capability, basic ideas of, of nuclear deterrence or deterrence in general, can I hold or threaten to hurt or take away something you value? And that's a very complicated thing. If someone is simply out to destroy, deterrence becomes very hard. But most actors have some political goals. And if the issue then is can they achieve them, um, how can you dis impose costs on them, and in an effort to achieve them, do they expose themselves to being uh, to suffering costs? A prerequisite to deterrence is: Can I impose costs big enough to outweigh what you gain? You need to know a lot about the details of terrorist organizations, and it varies from time to time. But if you think of them not as simply out to impose horrible costs on an adversary, but out to achieve some sort of political goal, it makes the problem perhaps more complicated. But well, since the scary stuff is coming this afternoon, less, a, a little more cheerful. Please. I got here a little late, so please forgive me if any of this is redundant, but, um, or should be saved for the scary stuff. But uh, somebody mentioned last night, and is it true that uh, the US is currently on a big push to develop suitcase size nuclear weapons. And uh, my immediate reaction to that was how scary, because if we did develop them, assuming we will develop them, then they're just that much more available to terrorist uh, leaks and, and use. And why, w what would be the argument that we should develop them, obviously first, but why should they be developed with our superior resources? so that they can then be misused. Thank you. Do you know? My understanding is that there have been three different proposals for new nuclear weapons that have been um, suggested by, by the administration uh, over the last uh, seven years. Uh, one is, is uh, to produce a new weapon that has variable yield that could be therefore be made much smaller and would include these kinds of options. That, however, has been rejected by Congress. The second is a bunker buster weapon, one that could go deeper underground, would have to be tested in order to ensure that its package would stay together after it penetrated uh, rock or, or deep soil. That, too, was rejected, uh, not so much for the reasons that I was suggesting that we don't want to threaten to use nuclear weapons against deeply buried biological uh, weapons facilities, for example, was one of the targets being suggested, but rather because it would require testing and would cut against uh, the eventual hope of getting a comprehensive test ban. The last, however, is the replacement, re the reliable replacement warhead, the RRW. Um, that is not, in my judgment, designed to, um, to produce lower yields, but rather to maintain greater assurance in the um, stockpiles uh, ability to continue on with its current capabilities over time. Uh, it is still under study. It is claimed to be able to be done without uh, testing, but there are suspicions about whether that no testing side of the RRW uh, would hold over time. So Congress has not made a final decision. And my guess is that there won't be a final decision until the next administration comes on board. I would just add, though, that um, none of those are, would, be ca would be smaller than weapons that we already have built. I and mean, we've had very small weapons for a very long time. Um, and so the, the whole debate now about new weapons and various purposes is not about making a weapon that's smaller or easier to carry around than, than ones that we've had since the, um, you know, the beginning of the Cold War or the early Cold War. There are at least. How small are they now? Um, well, we've had nuclear artillery shells in the 50s. Yeah. Yeah. We had atomic demolition munition, which were, were ones that an individual would carry on his back. Uh, and they were used to penetrate or to go behind uh, 
Warsaw Pact lines and plant them at, at bridges or other facilities. Uh, whether those are still in the uh, uh, arsenal today, I don't know. What's happened over the last 20 years is that many weapons have been taken out of the standard arsenal and put into um, storage. That is, they are in reserve. They have not been t totally decommissioned. But which ones of the Army ones uh, are at what stage, I don't know. I've heard stories that the Soviet Union developed suitcase weapons. Do you know the public status? Is there a consensus view of that? Was that true that they did? The public view is that it, that is true. Uh, there have been claims by some Soviet officials that they don't have accurate inventories uh, of all of them. Um, I think that it, most people who have looked at the Nunn Luger program think that there is a serious problem of those kinds of weapons, but uh, there's no evidence that any have gone missing thus far. Just a reminder, scary stuff is coming later. Question. question in the back. Okay, I'm Brad DeLong from Berkeley Economics. And there's one thing that's always sort of puzzled me about the focus of this literature. Um, something that was raised during the comments by um, the change in the metaphor from being two people playing brink chicken driving toward each other in cars to each car having five people with conflicting goals and ideas and fears. Um, let me put it this way. Um, back in the 1580s, um, back in the 1580s, Queen Elizabeth I's spymaster, Sir Francis Walsingham, argued in her Privy Council that England should have no hesitation in aiding the fundamentalist Protestant insurgents in the Low Countries. If the world's dominant military superpower, Spain, um, against which the insurgents were fighting, if the dominant superpower, Spain, took offense, and responded by sending a Spanish armada into the English Channel, say. Sir Francis Walsingham said that because the English were on the side of God, the Archangel Michael and Jesus Christ themselves would come down from heaven, fight in the Channel, and destroy the Spanish fleet. And Francis Walsingham's faction won. And Queen Elizabeth enthusiastically engaged in brinksmanship in the Low Countries throughout the 1580s. Now, Thinking about this history, um, if I were an Israeli or an Iranian or a Pakistani or an Indian politician, I would think of myself not as a unified national state playing a negative sum game of brinksmanship against other national states in the region. Um, I would think of myself as a politician in trouble, primarily playing a cooperative positive sum game with my fellow politicians in other countries a game in which the object is to achieve the positive goal of collective survival, to minimize the risks that my own colonels and other people's colonels will think like Sir Francis Walsingham did 430 years ago in the throes of the Reformation, and believe that um, the hand of God held over them would protect them against serious bad consequences, no matter whatever they do. Yet it seems to me that the unreliability of one's own military in a strongly ideological world, whether the ideology is that of Marxism, Leninism, Stalinism, Maoism, or of the John Birch Society, or of Al-Qaeda, or of any of a host of others, is something that ought to be at the center of this literature, and it somehow isn't. Certainly, I've written a lot about why this is a, a particular problem, and uh, I agree very much that um, both, both studying action. history and studying military operations and the domestic politics mm -hmm. are, is a necessary component to strengthen um, more formal model approaches in order to understand the logic and then the problems of implementation. But you and aren't the dominant faction in this literature, and I kind of think you ought to be. Well, I, 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 appreciate, <laughs> I appreciate the, 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 the compliment, uh, and I think that this, these different parts of literature need to uh, work together, and I think the, the three of us are a sign of, uh, of how people can work together. Okay. That seems like a very cheery note to uh, end the program. And uh, please.
I, did, I just one one final comment it was, it was for the, all the grad students uh, here, but also for myself and for, for Tom Shelley, which is um, the one bad, the worst decision I made. Not the one bad. The worst decision I ever made in grad school was after attending Tom's first class in the fall of my first year of my PhD class. I realized I can take this class later, and I was instead took a different class. <coughs> I've regretted that for well over 20 years now. Because I thought, oh, I can take it later, but then I started teaching and the classes uh, overlapped. Then I went to Washington and had a fellowship there and never got back to take Tom's class. So my one suggestion to all grad students is when you've got an incredible professor who's offering something, realize you should take advantage of your opportunities before uh, they slip away from you. And it is great to be able to uh, tell, pass that on to you so that you don't make the mistakes uh, that I made. But it's wonderful to have Tom Schelling here uh, to be able to tell him that story now. I'd like to thank both Charlie and Scott for fascinating presentations and turn the panel over to John Quigley. Thanks to Robert and thanks to the panel. We'll now stand adjourned for half an hour. We'll reconvene at uh, 11 o'clock. <laughs>